Welcome to The Loop Podcast, where we are transforming education in plastic surgery since 2020. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Loop Podcast. Today's episode is a resident-based in-service review of breast reduction. This is a supplementary episode and not a comprehensive review. This is a breakdown of key points from previous examinations from the ACAPS website that may help studying for boards or in-service. This is a pretty short topic and has some overlap with some other core topics listed in the core quest, and so that usually means it is a high-yield and highly tested subject. I have with me here Dr. Sanam Zahedi. How are you doing? Good. How's it going? Good. Uh, let's get started. All right. Well, let's focus on history, physical exam, and imaging. Let's start off with obtaining a history from a patient who's interested in breast reduction. There's several important things to ask a patient who's looking to get breast reduction surgery. The Gale Assessment Model is a validated tool to assess risk of breast cancer. It encompasses personal and family history of breast cancer, breast biopsies, or breast surgery. Other factors include lifetime estrogen exposure, such as age at menarche, menopause, number of pregnancies, age of first pregnancy, use of birth control. All of these factors significantly affect the risk of breast cancer. I think the more exposure to estrogen, the more risk that the patient is at for getting breast cancer. Breastfeeding history and future plans for having children are also important things to consider, especially with younger women. Although rare, it is important to discuss the risk of breastfeeding problems after surgery and that future pregnancies may lead to recurrent ptosis. It is important to ask about nicotine use and canceling the patients to stop smoking to decrease wound healing complications. The importance of erogenous breast sensation should be noted as decreased or complete absence of breast sensation is possible after surgery. In terms of HPI, it's important to ask about duration and locations of symptoms, alleviating factors, documented conservative measures, history of rash, intertriginous infections, shoulder grooving, and postural changes. So Brian, what are some important things to look for on a physical exam? Physical exam should note any asymmetry between breasts. It should include a complete bimanual exam for masses in bilateral breasts and axilla and looking for any scars on the breast that would indicate any previous biopsies or surgeries. It is also important to note if there's any discharge from the nipple. Breast measurements are also important to help plan for surgery, and those measurements usually include sternal notch to nipple, midclavicular to nipple, and nipple to IMF distance. Moving on to imaging and surveillance. A screening mammography or a screening mammogram is for normal routine surveillance, and that's usually recommended for patients who have no evidence of mass or clinical suspicion of mass, and this is just for routine surveillance. The American College of Surgeons recommends for breast cancer screening an average risk asymptomatic women to start their screening at age 40 to 44 years old, annual screening 45 to 54 years old and biennial screening for women older than 55 years old who is in good health and life expectancy greater than 10 years. There are several different societies with slightly different recommendations, and I'll mention them here. American College of Radiology recommends screening to start at 40 years old, and the U.S. PSTF recommends biennial mammogram between 50 and 74. In patients who are of an age when standard age of breast surveillance is recommended, usually around 40 years old, Obtaining a screening mammography should be done prior to breast reduction surgery. In patients who are younger than recommended routine screening, some surgeons prefer to always obtain a preoperative baseline screening mammography, but that's not formally endorsed. Sanam, is there a difference between screening and diagnostic mammogram? Bringing back the general surgery days? Yes, there definitely is. A diagnostic mammogram is different than a screening mammogram. A diagnostic mammogram is usually done after a patient or a provider palpates a mass in the breast and needs additional views to better characterize that mass. So for example, if a patient noticed a self-detected mass on a self-breast exam or their doctor found a breast mass on clinical breast exam, then the first step would be to obtain a diagnostic mammogram. MRI is an adjunct to mammogram in cases of known BRCA mutation or if a first-degree relative has BRCA mutation. Ultrasound is another adjunct to mammograms. It's useful in patients with dense breast tissue, and it helps characterizes the breast mass to determine whether it's fluid-filled or solid. 
Now let's talk about the risk of breast cancer and incidental findings after breast reduction. This seems to come up in the in-service every single year. Yeah, so if performing an ipsilateral mastectomy for breast cancer with contralateral breast reduction for symmetry, there is a 5% probability of an occult breast cancer detected incidentally in tissue specimen for the reduction. The rate of incidental breast cancer found in a specimen of reduction in an average risk patient is approximately 1%. There are some other incidental findings that typically come up on the exam. For example, incidental ALH or atypical lobular hyperplasia. This increases the risk of breast cancer. And at that point, you would want to refer the patient to a breast or oncology surgeon. Incidental ADH or atypical ductor hyperplasia is also putting the patient at an increased risk for breast cancer. You start by doing a risk assessment model. You can use the Gale assessment model to determine if uh, the patient's at high risk. And then again, you want to refer to a breast or oncology surgeon. If a one centimeter papilloma is found on a pathological specimen, the first thing you want to do is get a mammogram. Regardless if the patient had a screening or diagnostic mammogram before the surgery, you want to repeat that and then again, refer out to a breast or oncology specialist. Santa, what are the high yield benign breast masses we should know? Well, the first one that comes to mind is accessory breast tissue. That occurs along the embryonic milk line and enlarges during hormonal stimulation like puberty. It's rapid enlargement associated with pain. And on histology, you're going to see glandular tissue and potentially receptor staining for estrogen and progesterone. The second one is fibroadenoma. That's a firm rubbery nodule, usually within the ectopic breast. And on histology, you're going to see epithelial and stromal proliferation. Uh, the next one is lipoma. On histology, of course, you're going to see mature adipose tissue. And then you have juvenile papillomatosis or the Swiss cheese disease. On histology, you're going to see epithelial hypoplasia, papillomatosis, fluorescing adenosis, and cysts. About 10% of them have malignant transformation, and they occur in pediatric patients. Ironically, though, more common in adults. So, Brian, what are some other breast conditions that I haven't mentioned? Sure. We'll talk about galactorrhea. It's usually multifactorial in etiology. It usually happens from a stimulation of prolactin secretion. It can be a pathophysiologic reason. It can happen from breast manipulation. It can happen from a periareolar incision or irritation from the fourth intercostal nerve, and that affects the afferent signal to the pituitary gland. The treatment for this is bromocryptine. Next is juvenile or virginal hypertrophy of breast. This is growth of breast tissue due to hypertrophy of stromal component of the breast tissue, which is connective tissue of the breast, including fibroblasts and fat. Next, let's talk about blood supply and sensation to the breast and nipples. This is extremely high yield. So for blood supply, the nipple, the internal thoracic artery is the dominant supply. In terms of breast reduction, there's different pedicles that you're going to think of. And for anybody who's interested in imaging, Dr. Hall Finley has a great PRS paper on this topic, and we're going to include imaging on our YouTube site. So for anybody who wants to follow along with imaging as I'm describing this, you're welcome to refer to our YouTube channel. But let's talk about inferior pedicle. So the blood supply for an inferior pedicle comes from both the deep artery and vein coming just above the fifth rib and the more superficial arteries from the fifth inner space coursing down around the periphery of the breast and then traveling up in the subcutaneous tissue. For a central pedicle, the blood supply is dependent entirely on the artery and vena common sense that penetrate up from the fourth inner space. For a superior pedicle, the blood supply is from the descending branch of the artery coming from the second inner space of the internal mammary system. And for a medial pedicle, the blood supply curves up around the periphery of the breast from the third inner space and runs in the subcutaneous tissue towards the nipple. In terms of nipple sensation, if you're having a wise pattern reduction with a superior medial pedicle, the terminal branches of the fourth and fifth anterior intercostal nerves provide your main sensation because your lateral branches are sacrificed as part of the breast that's excised. But if you're not having a wise pattern reduction then and you just are talking about normal breast sensation in a breast that's never been operated on, then the lateral branches of the fourth and fifth intercostal nerves are going to give you the main nerve innervation. 
Lastly, let's go over some of the most common complications after brush reduction surgery. So some of the most common complications happen with delayed wound healing, and that's typically at the T-junction of a wise pattern incision. The next most common complication is a spitting suture. It's quoted around 9%. Hematoma, around 3 to 4%. Nipple necrosis is about 3.5%. Hypertrophic scars, 2.5%. Fat necrosis is 1.8 percent, but there are certain risk factors that can increase that risk. For example, a tissue resection weight, a long sternal notch to nipple distance of greater than 37 centimeters, elevated BMI. There are some other less clear risk factors that could increase the risk of fat necrosis, and that includes smoking and surgical technique. Hormonal therapy and birth control pills are not considered risk factors for fat necrosis. Neither is age or history of massive weight loss. If a mass is palpated postoperatively, it's important to do an ultrasound and a mammogram to confirm suspicions of fat necrosis. Some other less common complications include seroma, that's about 1%, or infection, that's about, again, 1%. Breastfeeding complications is a potential risk, although it's, it's very rare, and the only technique that can mitigate that risk, this was a question on in-service, was liposuction is the most protective of this risk and complication, as you're not cutting, you're just using a cannula. Well, that ends our quick review of breast reduction. Just a reminder, this is not a comprehensive talk, just going over the most recent ACAPS uh, published in-service exam and hope to see you guys next time. Have a good one.